The Bizarre Disappearance of Lars Mittank. On July 8th, 2014, a German citizen by the name of Lars Mittank joined his friends on holiday in Bulgaria. When he arrived at the airport, he disappeared, never to be seen again. His last moments were captured on CCTV. To this day, his whereabouts are still unknown. Sit back as we look into just what might have happened to Lars Mittank. Investigation Hour. A group of friends, all in their 20s, arrived in Varna, Bulgaria on June 30th and planned to return home to Germany on July 7th. While on vacation, they went out for a night of fun and Lars would end up getting into two separate fights with some locals. Lars had gotten into an argument in a bar with four other Germans over football. They all left the bar and Mittank had disappeared while waiting for his friends to get McDonald's. This would be the last time they see Lars until early the next morning. He would then later share that he had been beaten up by the same German men from the same local bar. That day, Lars went to a doctor where he would learn he suffered from a damaged jaw, a concussion, and a ruptured eardrum. He was prescribed Cefprazil, 500 milligrams, an antibiotic used to treat bacterial infections. The doctor advised Lars not to fly with his condition. The day of the group's flight back home, Lars told them he would be staying behind in Bulgaria and would take a flight the next day. His friends tried to stay in Bulgaria with him, but he insisted he was fine, and they boarded the plane home without him. This is the last time they would see their dear friend. Lars checked into a hotel for the night. There, his mom would receive strange and concerning text messages and calls from her son. He told her to call and have his credit card blocked and that he didn't feel safe at the hotel. He was worried about the medication he took and asked his mom to look into it. He then called his mother and whispered that some people wanted to rob or kill him. Hotel cameras recorded Lars hiding in the elevator, pacing in the foyer, looking out of the window, and then leaving the building at midnight to return a few hours later. His mom was relieved when Lars texted her in the morning saying, I just made it to the terminal. She convinced him to check into the Varna Airport's doctor's office to have his ear checked out before the flight. From there, something odd happened. CCTV caught Lars leaving the doctor's office, abandoning his wallet, phone, and luggage. He ran frantically out of the airport terminal, leaving the building and jumping over a fence into the woods, never to be seen or heard from again. This is the last known footage of Lars Mittank. Before Lars left the doctor's office, he was heard saying, I don't want to die here. I have to get out of here. He was in a panic, and after that statement, he dropped everything and frantically ran out of the doctor's office. Theories. There's many theories about what really happened to Lars. His mother believes he may have lost his memory due to the concussion and his ruptured eardrum. Maybe damage to his brain caused him confusion. Another theory is that Lars was actually murdered. He mentioned to his mother he was being followed and didn't feel safe. Perhaps someone was following him. Could he have run into one of those men at the airport? Were those men from the bar still chasing him? An additional theory could be that the antibiotic Lars was taking could have caused him some strange side effects. It's possible that if Lars took these antibiotics in combination with drugs or alcohol, it could potentially cause a psychotic episode. Acute psychosis is a potential side effect of some antibiotics. This could explain Lars's extreme confusion and fear following the fight. There have been tips and sightings around the world of men who have looked like Lars, 
but nothing showed up to be the real Lars. What really happened to Lars Midtank? Did he lose his mind? His memory? Or was he running from someone? What was he so afraid of that he abandoned all his belongings and his entire life? The case of missing nine-year-old Walter Collins and the chicken coop murders. On March 10th, 1928, Christine Collins was finally reunited with her missing boy. Only something was off about him. He wasn't the same kind, well-mannered boy she had raised. Three weeks had passed and she was convinced this was not her son, Walter. On March 10th, 1929, in Los Angeles, California, a nine-year-old Walter Collins was given money from his mother to go see a movie. It was the 20s and it was normal for a young kid to feel safe walking alone in the neighborhood. Unfortunately, Walter never made it back home. Did he even make it to the movie? Where did the nine-year-old vanish to? Five days had passed since his disappearance. His mother called the police and officially reported him missing. Hmm, that's strange though, right? I mean, five days? That's a long time. Seems a little odd, don't you think? That's the first weird thing about this story. It only gets weirder and weirder. And it seems to go down a rabbit hole of disturbing events. Police had searched for months, receiving tips from all around the country. Finally, in August 1929, Illinois police picked up a runaway boy on the road who matched Walter's description. He talked with police and said, he is the Walter Collins boy and described in detail his abduction and what happened to him. Christine talked with Walter over the phone and paid $70 to have him return to her in Los Angeles. All seemed well and the case was solved. That is until three weeks later. Christine claimed to police that this was not my son. Police insisted this was indeed Walter, and even went as far as running tests to determine if this was him. Tests that were, well, strange and rather shoddy. One test was having his family dog confront him, and another was having Walter find his way back home. Christine was not convinced. The boy was one inch shorter than Walter's actual height. And she even pulled dental records to show this was not the same child. J.J. Jones, the LAPD captain, was so angered with Christine over this, he had her admitted to a mental hospital to have her evaluated. While she was in the hospital, the boy had spoken with J.J. Jones, and he finally admitted he was not Walter Collins. His name was actually Arthur Hutchins. He had run away from his home, hitchhiking and traveling, when someone had mentioned he looked eerily similar to the missing boy, Walter Collins. He had got an idea. He would pass himself off as the missing child and catch a free ride to Hollywood, California, where he dreamed of meeting his favorite famous actor, Tom Mix. Christine was released from the mental hospital. On September 13th, 1928, she filed suit against J.J. Jones, for $10,800. J.J. Jones was suspended only for a time from his job, and Christine was never paid. The mystery doesn't end there, though. Nearly 50 miles east of Los Angeles, something very disturbing would come to light. In Wineville, California, now named Miraloma, lay a three-acre chicken farm owned by a man named Gordon Stewart Northcott. He lived on the farm with his mother, Sarah Louise. Gordon had convinced his sister, who lived in Canada, to send her 14-year-old son, Sanford, to work on his farm. While there, Sanford would be exposed to horrors. Gordon would physically, emotionally, and sexually abuse him. 
He would later tell this and more to the police. He would share that his uncle and grandmother would torture, molest, and kill boys on the farm, locking them in cages and forcing Sanford to help dispose of the bodies. Gordon's family was concerned when they weren't receiving letters from him, but rather letters from Gordon about how everything was fine on the farm. Sanford's mother sent his sister to the farm to go check up on him. There, Sanford would whisper to her what was really happening on the farm. When his sister returned home, his mother contacted the American consul, stating that Gordon had smuggled an illegal worker there from Canada, her son. When the police arrived on the scene, Gordon and his mother fled. There, they took Sanford into custody, and he was finally safe. Police would search the property and find blood stains all over the farm, graves, and belongings from the missing boys. Some items included Boy Scout badges, letters, and clothing. Could Walter Collins be one of the boys that was taken to the farm and murdered? Sanford would tell police he witnessed kidnapping, molestation, torture, and killing of several young boys. Gordon would dissolve the bodies using quicklime, bury their remains, and even burn their remains. Sanford had later identified Walter as one of the young boys who was on the farm. But unfortunately, there was no physical evidence of Walter being there. No body was found or personal belongings. Another thing is, Sanford was not a credible source. He had identified another boy who he claims was murdered on the farm, but that same boy was later found alive and well in a nearby city. So Sanford's ability to identify was not reliable, which is understandable with all the horrors he had seen and been through. On September 20th, 1928, Gordon and his mother were found in Calgary, Canada, and extradited to the USA to stand trial for their crimes. Gordon would confess to the murder of nine boys, but he would only be officially charged for three of those murders due to the lack of evidence. Those victims were two brothers, Louis Winslow and Nelson Winslow, aged 12 and 10, and the third, Alvin Gothia, who had been found missing his head. Sanford confessed to helping his uncle dispose of the boy's skull. Gordon was sentenced to death by hanging. He died on October 2nd, 1930. It's believed he may have had up to 20 victims. His mother was sentenced to life in prison after confessing to the murders and additionally for killing Walter Collins with an axe and burying him in a chicken coop. She later retracted her statement. During her imprisonment, Sarah Louise made some bizarre claims about her son. She proclaimed his innocence even after his death and that she was Gordon's grandmother. This was the result of incest between her husband and their daughter. Additionally, she claimed that he was sexually abused by the entire family as a child. While in prison, Gordon had sent Christine Collins a letter stating that if she came to visit him, he would tell her what happened to her son. The day before his execution, she went to visit him, only for him to say, I don't want to see you. I don't know anything about it. I'm innocent. After his death, notes were found around his prison cell accusing his father of the murder and stating that he never even met Walter. Theories. One theory is that Walter Collins' father was in prison and would snitch on other inmates. And he believes because of this, one of the other inmates kidnapped and murdered his son for revenge. Another theory is that Walter is still alive out there somewhere and chose to run away from his mom. Perhaps he was running from an abusive home life? 
This would explain why she took five days to report her nine-year-old son missing. Or maybe his own mother was involved in his death somehow. What do you believe happened to Walter Collins? The True Story of The Watcher House It was a picturesque neighborhood. Derek and Maria Broadus had just found their dream home in Westerfield, New Jersey. This would be the perfect home to raise their three children. It was big and full of light with a beautiful backyard. But something frightening would occur and they would never move into their beautiful new house on 657 Boulevard. In June 2014, Derek and Maria bought the 657 Boulevard home for $1.3 million. Before moving in, Derek had decided to fix up the place and brought in some construction workers to finish renovations and to prepare the house for his family. One night after a long day of renovations, Derek checked the home's mailbox. Inside was a white envelope with thick black lettering. Written on top was, to the new owners. Inside was a typed letter reading, Dearest new neighbor at 657 Boulevard, allow me to welcome you to the neighborhood. How did you end up here? Did 657 Boulevard call to you with its force within? 657 Boulevard has been the subject of my family for decades now. And as it approaches its 110th birthday, I've been put in charge of watching and waiting for its second coming. My grandfather watched this house in the 1920s, and my father watched it in the 1960s. And now it's my time. Do you know the history of this house? Do you know what lies within the walls? Up 657 Boulevard. Why are you here? I'll find out. I see already that you have flooded 657 Boulevard with contractors so that you can destroy the house as it was supposed to be. Bad move. You don't want to make 657 Boulevard unhappy. You have children. I've seen them. So far, I think there are three that I've counted at least. Are there any more on the way? You need to fill the house with the young blood I requested? Better for me. Was your old house too small for the growing family? Or was it greed to bring me your children? Once I know their names, I will call to them and draw them to me. Who am I? Hundreds of cars pass by the house every single day. Maybe I'm in one. Check all the windows that can be seen from 657 Boulevard. Perhaps I'm in one. Welcome, my friends. Welcome. Let the party begin. Signed, The Watcher. Was this a prank? Derek was freaked out. Derek immediately left and raced home to his family to discuss this with his wife. They emailed the former homeowners, John and Andrea Woods, to see if they had received similar letters. They had owned and lived in the home for 23 years before selling it to the Broadus family. In all of their 23 years living there, they claimed to have never received a letter. Until a few weeks before moving out in May. They received a letter in the mail, but they brushed it off, assuming it was a weird prank, and they threw it away. Over the next few weeks, they avoided the house. The letter writer could be any one of their neighbors, watching them, waiting for them. They had interacted with some of the neighbors there, chatting and getting to know the other families and couples. One day, Derek had given a tour to a neighborhood couple. The woman had mentioned, 
How nice it will be to have some young blood in the neighborhood. Derek stared, wide-eyed at her, in suspense. Why would she say that? The police weren't much help in figuring out who this letter writer could be. Derek and Maria decided not to tell anyone about the letters they were receiving. They had attended barbecues in the neighborhood and met with everyone to try and gather clues. At one point, Derek had spoken with a fellow neighbor, John Schmidt, who had mentioned the Langfords. They were the neighbor to the Broaddus' new home. He described the family as odd. Peggy Langford, the mother, was in her 90s, and her children all lived with her there, all in their 60s. He highlighted Michael Langford, her son, who was a strange character. Derek brought this up to the police, and they had already interviewed him and was ruled out as a suspect. Maria Broaddus would sometimes bring the children over to the house to play in the yard or to hang out while renovations were being done. One evening, she came back to the house alone and noticed another letter. Welcome again to your new home at 657 Boulevard. The workers have been busy, and I've been watching you unload. Careful of your personal belongings. The dumpster's a nice touch. The house is crying from all of the pain it is going through. You've changed it and made it so fancy. You're stealing its history. It cries for the past and what used to be in the time when I roamed its halls. The 1960s were a good time for 657 Boulevard. When I ran from room to room imagining the life with the rich occupants there. The house was full of life and young blood. Then it got old. So did my father. But he kept watching until the day he died. And now I watch and wait for the day when the young blood will be mine again. Have they found what is in the walls yet? In time they will. I am pleased to know your names now and the name of the young blood you have brought to me. You certainly say their names often. 657 Boulevard is anxious for you to move in. It has been years and years since the young blood ruled the hallways of the house. Have you found all of the secrets it holds yet? Will the young blood play in the basement? Or are they too afraid to go down there alone? I would be very afraid if I were them. It is far away from the rest of the house. If you were upstairs, you would never hear them scream. Will they sleep in the attic? Or will you all sleep on the second floor? Who has the bedrooms facing the street? I'll know as soon as you move in. It will help me to know who is in which bedroom. Then I can plan better. All the windows and doors in 657 Boulevard Allow me to watch you and track you as you move through the house. Who am I? I'm the Watcher, and I've been in control of 657 Boulevard for the better part of two decades now. The Woods family turned it over to you. It was their time to move on, and kindly sold it when I asked them to. I pass by many times a day. 657 Boulevard is my job, my life my obsession. And now, you are too, Brutus family. Welcome to the product of your greed. Greed is what brought the past three families to 657 Boulevard, and now it has brought you to me. Have a happy moving day. You know I'll be watching. After this, they wouldn't be bringing the kids back to the house. And they decided to take matters into their own hands. They set up web cameras around the house, a new alarm system was installed, and they hired a private investigator. Derek would go as far as to sleep inside the house and wait for someone to break in or to leave another letter. They were living in constant fear and paranoia. Finally, 
letter number three arrived. And the watcher was angry and getting more delusional. 657 Boulevard is turning on me. It's coming after me. I don't understand why. What spell did you cast on it? It used to be my friend and now is my enemy. I am in charge of 657 Boulevard. It is not in charge of me. I will fend off its bad things and wait for it to become good again. It will not punish me. I will rise again. I will be patient and wait for this to pass and for you to bring the young blood back to me. Let the young blood play again like I once did. Let the young blood sleep in 657 Boulevard. Stop changing it and let it alone. They had decided to have the letter analyzed to try and get an idea of who could be writing them. The analyst determined it was most likely an older person with real anger behind their words and that it could even be a woman. In fact, a DNA analysis would be done on the letters. No fingerprints would be found, but DNA would show that it did belong to a woman. The Broadduses filed suit against the Woods, claiming they were not properly informed of the dangers the house entailed. But unfortunately, the suit was dismissed. Because of the lawsuit, the letters got out into the public, causing many of the townspeople to gossip and become afraid. Now everyone knows about this ordeal. Letter number four would soon come after. You wonder who the Watcher is? Turn around, idiots. Maybe you even spoke to me. One of the so-called neighbors who has no idea who the Watcher could be. Or maybe you do know and are too scared to tell anyone. Good move. I walked by the news trucks when they took over my neighborhood and mocked me. I watched as you watched from the dark house in an attempt to find me. Telescopes, binoculars, are wonderful inventions. 657 Boulevard survived your attempted assault and stood strong with its army of supporters barricading its gates. My soldiers of the boulevard followed my orders to a T. They carried out their mission and saved the soul of 657 Boulevard with my orders. All hail the Watcher. After much thought and deliberation, they decided to try and sell the house. It was tough. Some people were interested, but Maria and Derek wanted to give full disclosure on the letters so no one would have to live in fear like they did. Most people were deterred after learning about the letters and some even reading them. A year had passed and no letters had arrived. They had finally found someone to rent the house. In the rental contract was a clause that if another letter were to come, they could leave the house immediately. Two weeks after the family moved into the new home, of course, another letter comes in. Violent winds and bitter cold to the vile and spiteful Derek and his wench of a wife, Maria. Maybe a car accident, maybe a fire, maybe something as simple as a mild illness that never seems to go away, but makes you feel sick day after day after day after day. Maybe the mysterious death of a pet. Loved ones suddenly die. Planes and cars and bicycles crash. Bones break. The Broadus family no longer lived in the house, but they were still prisoners of it. The rent barely covered the mortgage and the property tax on a $1.3 million home. They missed Christmases with their young kids and even suffered from PTSD. Not to mention knowing the letter writer had gotten away with it, that they would never know who the watcher was. Theories. Obviously, the Langfords were at the forefront of the investigation. They lived in the house since the 60s. Their father had passed away 12 years prior to the Broadduses moving in, which, in one of the letters the writer said, 
My granddad had watched the house in the 20s and my dad in the 60s, and now it's my turn. Since the DNA was linked to a woman, could it have been Peggy Langford, the mother? The daughter was actually ruled out. They had tested her DNA against the letter's DNA, and it wasn't a match. But they never tested Peggy's DNA. And I wonder why. All the families before the Broadduses had never received any letters like this. Could the Watcher have been someone who grew up in the house? The Watcher knows about the house and the layout and what the inside looks like. This brings up Michael Langford again. He was a schizophrenic and had a habit of looking into people's houses. He also grew up in that house, playing with the neighbor kids as a child. Another strange theory is based upon a car that pulled up in front of the house at 11 p.m. Luckily, private investigators were staking out that night. They linked the car to a girlfriend of a guy who lived on the block. She said her boyfriend was into dark horror games. And oddly enough, one of the games was called The Watcher. Police tried to interview him, but he never showed up to be questioned on two separate occasions. An additional theory focuses on the older couple in their 60s that lives directly behind the Broaddus' home. They had lived there for 47 years. This is the same couple where the construction worker at the Broaddus' home mentioned seeing them sitting on their porch facing the Broaddus' home on multiple occasions almost watching the home, sitting very close to the fence. They had a full view of the home, the backyard, and the back porch. But even weirder is one of their kids had married a man who grew up in the Broaddus' house. They also had a perfect view of the house's backyard and were within earshot of hearing all their names. Unfortunately, this trail led nowhere. Maybe Derek Broaddus had an enemy, someone who knew him or his family and wanted to scare him or get back at him in some way, someone who wanted to ruin his finances, perhaps. Maybe we will never know who this sociopathic letter writer is. Thanks for listening. If you're into solved and unsolved crimes and strange mysteries, subscribe to us so you don't miss out on our weekly videos released every Monday at 2 p.m. Pacific time. If you enjoyed this video, give us a like. It would really help us out. Until next time.